Amen. I, I want to invite you, if you brought your Bible, and I hope you brought your Bible, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Now, now it's real easy to get to Exodus um, because it's the second book of the Bible. Um, so Genesis, Exodus, you know, so you, you shouldn't take too long to get there. Exodus chapter 1. Um, I, I'm going to ask in this moment, and I, I'm probably going to ask several, uh, several times uh, this question, but how, how many, let, let me say it in Spanish because it just flows easier for me. ¿Cuántas madrecitas lindas, bonitas, hermosas? How many beautiful, wonderful mothers do we have present in Pure Pueblo's Church? If you're a beautiful mother, will, will you raise your hand? Bad mothers, you can raise your hand as well. I'm just, I'm just kidding, right? All right. You know, let, let's have you all raise. All right. We want to wish you a Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother. As, as a matter of fact, Pueblo's Church, let's recognize them. Let's give them a round of applause. Let's give a round of applause to our, to our mothers. Happy Mother's Day, moms. Happy Mother's Day. Mo Mom, happy Mother's Day. Naya, Ronnie, happy Mother's Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we don't want them to get too spoiled. Let's, let's calm down a little bit, okay? All right. We're going to be looking at, at a certain portion of Scripture, but before we get there, I want to give you the background story. I want to, I want to prepare us uh, before we actually get into the portion that we're going to be studying. Um, God calls a man by the name of Abraham. Uh, Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. You know them as the 12 tribes of Israel. One of Jacob's uh, youngest son, who later Jacob's name is changed to Israel, one of Israel's youngest sons by the name of Joseph, somehow, and we don't have time to get into all the family dynamics, but he ends up in Egypt, and he ends up in Egypt as a slave, as a servant in, in, uh, in what we would say uh, the house of Potiphar. And, and there in that house, he, he rose up the ranks, um, but because of certain things, he ended up in prison. He ended up in jail. And in prison, in jail, God's grace, favor, wisdom was over him. And again, he rose up, and he was in charge of the whole jail, and then somehow, through, through the hand of God, Joseph, who came into Egypt as a young Hebrew boy, a young Hebrew man, as a, a slave, a servant, then a prisoner, ends up in the house of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's the king. Ends up in the king's house, second in power only to the king. There's a portion in Scripture where Joseph is described as a father to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's a king. So this becomes the most powerful man in Egypt. And he interprets a dream that Pharaoh had that they would have seven years of plentiful, of, of, of just, you know, abundance. But then there would be seven years of drought. And so he gave the advice of during the seven years of plentiful, of abundance, save, save some money, save some grain, save some cattle, save this and save that. And when the seven years of drought came, the Egyptians were prepared and they were able to live and survive. Not only did he save the Egyptians, but he saved people that lived around Egypt that were able to come and buy grain. And amongst them was his own family, the Hebrew people, the Israelites. Well, um, because of this, Pharaoh honored Joseph, honored his father, honored his brothers, but then time began to pass. Days became weeks, weeks became months, months became years, years became decades, decades became centuries, and four centuries passed. 400 years had passed since Joseph, and we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. Eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. There was a new pharaoh, a new king, and he didn't know, he didn't respect that, hey, Joseph, this Hebrew young man, had saved them, had positioned them to become a powerful nation, and, and he didn't know nothing about that. Verse 9 says, he said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us, and are stronger than we are. All he knew was that when he looked out at the Hebrew people, the Israelites, they were stronger, they were a bigger nation, they had prospered. Verse 10, he says, we must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, 
And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country, right? So these were the servants of the Egyptians. And the Pharaoh looks out and he goes, man, if we go to battle, we go to war. These guys are already strong. They're big. They're powerful. They can join our enemies. They can fight against us. And then they'll leave us. They, they, they won't serve us. They, they, they won't cut our grass. They won't clean our houses. They won't babysit our kids. Sounds like a certain people, but I'm not going to go there today. But anyways, they're like, they're going to leave. Verse 15. Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Sifra and Pua. Right, these were the names of two midwives. Sifra, no, Shifra and Pua. Pua, Pua in Spanish is Fua. Right? Like, what a beautiful name. Uh, maybe in these days I'll get to uh, uh, present to the church a, a little girl named Fua. Right? No? Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of y'all are like, what are you talking about? Like, like La Fua. Right? No? Si ya saben cómo me pongo para que me invitan, entonces, like that's all I got to say. Anyways, all right, let's keep reading. Verse 16. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, all right, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. All right, so they tell the midwives, look at the sex right? When the baby is born, look at the sex. Look at the gender. How many genders are there? Dose. <laughs> if it's a boy or if it's a girl, right? If it's a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live, right? But let me tell you, we, we laugh at there being dose genders, two genders, but there are people Teachers, professors that are teaching your kids, that will teach your kids that there's more than those, that there's more than two, that there's boys and there's girls, and then there's boys that think they're girls, that makes three, and there's girls that think they're boys, that makes four, right? and there's boys that think they're boys and girls at the same time, that makes five. And there's girls, that, although that should count for three. But anyways, we're speaking mathematically, right? And then there's girls that think they're boys and girls, and that's six. There are professors out there who believe that there's over a hundred different genders. And that today you can be a boy, and tomorrow you can be a girl, because it's fluid. This, this, this is what they teach in the university. This, this is what people believe. As a matter of fact, even amongst genders, where we would say he and she, there are some people that want to be called they. Right? In, in other words, their gender isn't boy or girl. Their gender is they. Like, you, you call them they, as in plural. They're singular, but they want to be no, plural. Or hims or hers. This is just crazy what we live in. All right. Anyways, I don't want, I don't, that, that's not my topic today. My topic is Mother's Day, but I'm just throwing it out there. Just so you know, we need to be praying. Verse 17 says, But because the midwives, everybody, let's read this part three times together. Because the midwives, feared God. Again, because the midwives feared God. One more time. Because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. So they allowed the boys, they allowed two boys to, the what? To live, right? They didn't abort them. They allowed the boys to live. Verse 22. Then Pharaoh gave the order to all his people. Now he's no longer with the midwives because they're like, man, you know, it's a boy. We're going to let him live. And it, no, no. So now Pharaoh gives the order. This is the whole nation. Throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. Right? If it's a boy, throw him into the river, right? Throw him into the river, let him drown. Let the crocodiles eat him. Do you, anybody know the difference between an alligator and a crocodile? I'll help y'all out. That's why y'all came to Pueblo's church, all right? 
An alligator will see you later, a crocodile after a while, all right? Just, just letting y'all know, all right? So somebody asks you, you know. I learned that at Pueblo's church. An alligator will see you later, but a crocodile after a while. Okay, anyways, y'all didn't know that? God, I tell you, I don't even know where sometimes to start in my teaching. Got to come from scratch, right? Over 3,200 years ago, the spirit of abortion was already active. Over 3,200 years ago, the spirit of abortion was already active. If it's a boy, abort, right? If it's a boy, abort. I don't know how many of you guys know, but um, during the four years that uh, we had uh, President Trump, President Trump answered the prayers of many evangelical Christians, especially in the English community, of putting Supreme Court judges that would be pro-life as opposed to pro-abortion. And there's a rumor, I don't, I don't, I don't know how, how true this is, but there's, there's a rumor out there that in the next few days, the Supreme Court is going to make a decision to reverse Roe versus Wade, to reverse um, the law that instituted abortion. Now, this is not going to make abortion illegal in the United States. Right. Um, when the Supreme Court made abortion legal, they, because they made it from the federal government, right, which the Supreme Court's federal, they made it legal in all 50 states. When they reverse, primeramente Dios, they will reverse, basically what they're going to do is they're going to throw it back to the states, and every state will then make a decision, are we a state that will support abortion, or are we a state that will be against abortion? And uh, certain states, such as Texas, um, have already passed um, laws where if a heartbeat is detected, you cannot abort, right? So you can de detect a heartbeat, you cannot abort. Basically, they've made abortion illegal for when that happens, boom, it's illegal like that. But there are other states that, uh, that um, will make it legal. And there are companies, companies like Amazon, that if you live like in a state like Texas and you want to have abortion and you want to go to, let's say, California to have your abortion, they will pay up to $4,000 for your travel expense to go travel over there, rent a hotel, go to the clinic, have your abortion, and then travel back. These are the days in which we live in, right? And, and let me tell you that if the Supreme Court reverses Way versus, um, uh, Roe versus Wade and throws it back to the states, vamos a ver demonios, right? We are going to see demons, all right? We're going to see the devil, all right? And demonios and demons coming against the church. There's a movement today in certain churches, big English churches, of uh, people who are for abortion or, or protesting outside of evangelical churches today on Mother's Day, which is ironic because they're mothers. They, and anyways, and um, so, uh, we'll see, but it, but it's okay. It's okay because Jesus said, "Upon this rock I shall build my church," speaking of Himself. All right? And he said, and not even the gates of Hades, not even the gates of hell will prevail against the church. The demons can come, the devil himself can come, but the church will continue to persevere going forward. All right? Okay, I don't, I don't want to get to, to the, my, my, whole, my whole message isn't about abortion, but anyways, just 3,200 years ago, ya andaba el demonio suelto. The title of my message today is A Tell of Two Mothers, right? A Tell of Two Mothers, Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. About this time, a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby. Some of your Bibles say that she saw that he was a beautiful baby and kept him hidden for three months. Now remember, the order, not just to the midwives, but to the entire nation was if it's a baby boy, abort him. Here, this mother sees that her son was beautiful, so she hides him for three months. Verse three says, but when she could no longer hide him, because he's getting bigger, he's starting to crawl, he's starting to cry louder. Soon he'll be, you know, getting ready to walk and, and, and all those type of things. He'll be travieso because he's a boy, right? Like all those type of things. She's like, okay, we can't keep doing this. She got a basket made of 
um, papyrus reed with, and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Let me help you out in case you don't know. We're talking about Moses. This is the story of Moses. I don't know, some of you might, might be a little bit lost. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there, right? So if, if I start talking about Moses, you're not like, wait, who's this Moses guy? It's the baby, all right? So here, this, this family from the tribe of, Levi, uh, of Levi have a baby. It's a baby boy. The mom sees it's beautiful, keeps them despite the law, despite society, despite what everyone is saying she should do, keeps the baby, raises them. But after three months, she's like, we just can't keep doing this. We're all at risk. She was at risk. Her family's at risk. The baby's at risk. She's like, we're all, we got to do something. She gets a basket. She prepares the basket, makes it waterproof. She puts the baby in the basket. She puts the basket in the banks of the river. She sends the sister, right? The, the older sister of this baby, the older sister of, of, of Moses, she's out and she's looking to see what's going to happen to the baby. If, if a crocodile was going to come, she was going to shoo it away. If, if, a, if a, you know, a dog was going to come, she was going to shoo it away. I don't know if she would actually shoo away a crocodile. I don't know if I would. I'll probably just grab the basket and run. But anyways, she was there to see what was going to happen. Verse 5 says, soon Pharaoh's daughter. Now, Pharaoh's the one that gave the order. If it's a boy, abort. All right. Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river. And as her attendants walked along the river bank, when the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. So, so here comes, of everybody that could come and take a bath at the river, Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, shows up and she sees the basket. So she tells one of her servants, hey, go and get the basket. So verse 6 says that when the princess opened it, she saw the baby. Uh-oh. And the little boy was crying and she had compassion for him. She felt sorry for him. And she said, this must be one of the Hebrew children. She recognized it's a Hebrew. I think he was more morenito. No, I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. But anyways, like she recognized, hey, this is a Hebrew child here. And while she's like processing, my dad said, to all the nation, a boredom. Verse seven says, then the baby's sister approached the princess. I like her. She wasn't part of the crew, but she came in running. And she says, should I go find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Huh? Verse eight. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went, and of all the Hebrew women that she could call, remember they had grown to be bigger and stronger than the Egyptians, she called her mama the baby's mama. Right? Verse 9 says, Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother, and I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her own baby home and nursed him. Right? Uh, moms, dads, and everybody in between that's here, if there's anything that you can take with you from this, which isn't even really my main point of this service, is that we serve a God of purpose, all right? We serve a God of purpose, okay? Not coincidence that Moses' mom put him in the river. Not coincidence that about that time, the princess, Pharaoh's daughter, shows up not coincidence that Moses' sister is looking and before she could finish processing in her mind what was she going to do with this child, uh, Moses' sister comes and suggests, hey, let me bring a Hebrew woman to nurse him for him. Not coincidence that of all the Hebrew women that they could have called on, they called on his mother to raise him. Let me tell you, it is not a coincidence that you are here today listening to this message. It is not a coincidence that you are raising the kids that you are raising. It is not a coincidence that the same God that Moses served is the God that we are dealing with in this moment. There is a purpose for your life. There is a purpose and a calling on your life. There is a reason that you're here, hearing what you're hearing today. Amazing. 
My message is a tale of two mothers. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the first mother. And the first mother's name is Jochebed. Right? Jochebed, her name comes out about two, two times, two, three times in the Bible. She is the mother of Moses. I'll never forget that one day we were at the house and my mom says, you know, I was reading the Bible and I found a beautiful name for a little girl. She was Jochebeth. It's so beautiful. We're all, oh, yeah, it sounds really cool, Jochebeth. And then um, I'll never forget, my mom says, oh, I hope that, I hope that one day I'll have a, a granddaughter named Jochebeth. And I don't know why my brother had four girls, and he didn't name not one of them Jochebeth. Like, I don't, I don't know why. He's here. He can like that. And all the other servers, everybody's like, what about you, pastor? I'm like, oh, I didn't think about that. <laughs> I'm just kidding, right? Maybe I'm the fourth one, mom. Maybe I'm the fourth one. Somebody, somebody after service told me that I was going to have five uh, after last service. So maybe I'm the fifth one. I don't know, mom. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, Jochebeth. Jochebeth in all the Bible is the first name to have the name of Yahweh. Yahweh is, is Jehová, right? The Lord. Jochebeth is the first name in all the Bible to have a portion of the name of God in the name. Right? Jochebeth. The tremendous mother, amazing mother, right? an amazing mother. And, and Jochebeth, it means God is glory, right? And we see the glory of God in her life as a mother. Right? Now, let's think about the situation in which Jochebeth gives birth and protects. Right? Not an ideal situation. It was dangerous times, horrible times. Their people were slaves. The king of the nation that had them captive had given the order that if you have a boy, you must kill, you must abort. She defies society. She defies the law. She defies the command of the king that could have been punishable for sin. She was risking herself. She was risking the baby. She was risking her entire family. For I mean, this is a tremendous mother. This, 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 this is one, as, as, as someone said, this, this is one heck of a woman. Today in the United States of America, Abortion is a billion dollar industry. A billion dollar industry. And, and let me tell you that the biggest abortion clinic in the United States is, is Planned Parenthood. And the majority of Planned Parenthood clinics, they're not in the barrio de los gringos. They're in the black neighborhoods and they're in the Hispanic neighborhoods. Perhaps the largest, when they opened it, it was the largest. I don't know if it still is, but the, lar the largest or one of the largest abortion clinics in the United States is here in Houston. I I'll help you out if you don't know wh which one it is. When you go to downtown, 45, like from, you know, here to downtown, you're going 45 north. It's that building on your left-hand side before you get to downtown that looks like stairs. It looks like steps. Right? It's just an observation that I made years ago. You won't see this anymore because of all the construction in downtown. But there was a point in time where you could stand in a certain portion of 45 in the middle of that clinic and in the middle of downtown. And behind you, south, right? We usually look at a map and south is down. Behind you, south, was the largest abortion clinic in the United States where they're literally fighting to kill, where they celebrate death. But if you would lift up your head and look up north, there is a hospital called St. Joseph's. And on the side of St. Joseph's at night, they had this big cross. So behind you were some that were celebrating and fighting for death, but before you was a sign of hope, was a sign of life, was a hospital where they were fighting to save people's lives. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? You know, we look at abortion today, and so many people have abortions, 
Many, many people have abortions. And I, I would dare say the vast majority of people have abortion out of convenience. You have that baby. You, you're not, Michael, you're not going to be able to go to school. It's a lie of the devil. School's always going to be there. But that's what they tell young ladies, young girls who get pregnant. You're not going to be able to go to school, Mika. Mika, look, look how well you're doing at work. You're just, you're just going and you're progressing. I mean, you have that baby. You, you, your career, you're going to jeopardize your career. You're, you're not going to be able to, to, to move up anymore. Like, like just, just have a board. Like, you're not going to be able to go out with your friends. You're not going to be able to go to Cancun. You're not going to be able to go here. You're not going to be able to go there. And, you know, and you're not going to be able to go to the club and what have you. Like, like just, just abort that child. Out of, in, out of convenience, people are having abortion. There was a time where when they would talk about abortion, they would talk about a fetus, abort the fetus. Just a few days ago, the president, the United States of America, President Joe Biden, he didn't use the word fetus. He used the word child. He's talking about aborting a child. Right? The way certain laws are written in some of these states, the way they're written, they're talking about aborting a child even after birth. We're living in crazy times, right? in crazy times. But Moses' mom, Jochebeth, saw something special in her child. Exodus chapter 2, verse 2 says, The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she saw that he was a special baby and did not abort but kept him hidden for three months. When I read this, I, 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 I'm reminded about when Rebecca Rose was born. We went into the hospital Monday, on a Monday, and we were there Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday. Nayeli's water broke Thursday. Um, she pushed for about 10 hours. Our, our doctor never showed up. Finally, another doctor shows up, and he comes and he looks at, at, at the crown of, 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 of the baby. We didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. He just looks at the crown. He looks at me, looks at Nayeli, and he says, you don't know me. I don't know you. But I'm going to tell you something you don't want to hear. We need to have a C-section. He looks at the nurse and he says, prepare everything for a C-section. Nurse looks at me and she says, Dad, you need to get all of y'all stuff. We're going to another room. She walks out. They both walk out. They turn off the lights. They left like one little light. And like this, depression fell over us. I mean, it was oppression. I, I, I looked at Nayeli. I could see her face just, just distraught broken. I mean, you know, like I, I, inside of me, I, I had this horrible depression. I was, I was just broken hearted. I didn't even want to look at Nayeli because I didn't want her to see my face, my reaction. I, I remember they told me to pick up our bags, right? Because we're going to move to another room. I remember trying to gather our bags and my hands shaking because I, I, I wanted to cry, but I didn't want to cry in, in front of my wife. And, um, and then all of a sudden these words came to me and, and I really feel like the Holy Spirit put these words in me. These words came to me and I looked at my wife and I told her in Spanish, I'm like, babe, no importa como venga, lo que importa es que venga, right? It doesn't matter how the baby comes. What matters is that the baby comes. And in that, I mean, literally within seconds, they come in. They're like, mom, let's go. Dad, let's go. And they take us to these other rooms. And, and, and they began the surgery to, to do a C-section on Nayeli. And, and then they call me. They're like, Dad, come in here. So I'm in there. And, and if you've never been in the room when they're doing a C-section, you know, it's not like the movies, like, ear, ear, ear. no, no. I mean, the lady is like, like she's like, Nayeli's literally just like shaking around where they're like sacudándola, as we would say, you know. All of a sudden, the doctor says, I knew it because everybody thought it was a boy because they were she was struggling so much. And the doctor says, I knew it. It's a girl. And then he got quiet. And then he says, and it's a big girl, right? <laughs> and they get her, they clean her. They put her in my arms. I should say they put her in my arms. <laughs> my little toddler. <laughs> it's love at first sight. Nayeli's in a daze. She's in pain. It was a, this is a horrible or, ordeal, right? And, and, and I'm like, do you want to see the baby? And, and she's like in, in it, out of it, in pain. And I remember she looks at me and she says, yes. 
and the doctor's working. You can smell like that burnt smell and all that that's going on. And, and, um, and so I, I bring the baby close to her. So she, and, and, and Nayeli said what Hoka Bet said. She's so beautiful, right? That, that's what Hoka Bet said. She saw, she saw Moses and she said, he's so beautiful. I, I, can't, I can't abort this. How many madrecitas, lindas, bonitas, hermosas, beautiful mothers do we have present? Leave your hand up. Leave your hand up. All right. I need you to raise your hand and then leave your hand up. Okay. How many of you, the first time you saw your child, you, you recognized, realized that your child was the most beautiful baby in the hospital? Like that. How is it that more hands came up than when I asked how many mothers like, like that? Oh, okay, you put your hand. All right. All right. Some of you are like, I'm not putting my hand down because mine was the most beautiful. Like that. Really? One eye bigger than the other, forehead todo aplastado. Well, some didn't even have hair. Well, they're like this, they're all wrinkled. He's so beautiful. Right, Pastor? Showing me the baby pictures, I'm all like, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not, I don't wanna offend, but I don't wanna lie. I'm just like, I mean, my, my babies were the most beautiful in the whole hospital. I mean, they were. You know, I don't know about yours. I wasn't there when yours were born, but mine really were the most beautiful. Right? Three months, she hid him. She protected him. She cared for him. And then with the permission of Pharaoh's daughter, she raised him, and she got paid to raise. Can you imagine how many moms present today wish that someone would pay you to raise your own kids? There's a lot of husbands today that are like, woman, what do you think I work for? Right? <laughs> she wasn't even part of the family. This princess, the Pharaoh's wife, as a matter of fact, she was part of the family of the enemy. But she paid this Hebrew woman to raise up this Hebrew boy who should have been aborted, who should have been killed, and, and he ra they, they raised him up. Now, now let me tell you that what I'm going to share with you is not in the Bible, but I know this for I know this. I just know this. All right. What do you think Hogabeth would tell Moses? You know what she would tell him? She would tell him, Mijo, when you're out there walking in the palace, don't forget where you came from. Right? Mijo, when you're out there riding on those chariots and eating fancy dinners, don't forget that you're one of us. You, you know what she was telling him? She was telling him, mijo, when you're out there and they're talking about the God of the sun and, and the moon, that, that's a God, and they're telling you that there's certain fish, that they're gods and the crocodiles are God, when they're talking about their religions and their spirituality, when you're out in their universities and they're showing you all of this, you recognize this, mijo, it is all nonsense. We serve the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Mijo, you need to know the truth. I know she told him about his identity. I know she told him about their gods. I know she told him about the truth. I know she told him not to bow before idols. What a tremendous mother, Hokabet. Man, what a tremendous mother, Hokabet. I like her. But my, my, my topic today is not the tale of a mother, but it's the tale of what? Two mothers. The tale of two mothers. Moses had another mom. Moses had another mom. Verse 10, Exodus chapter 2, verse 10. And verse 10 says, Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Isn't that something? We all recognize Hokabed, but we don't recognize Pharaoh's daughter, who was another mom to Moses. Now, Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, she didn't give Moses, she didn't give birth to Moses, but she did give Moses life. Right? She didn't give birth to Moses, but she did give Moses life, right? She represents 
what we would call today a stepmom, right? You married a man who has children. You have the obligation to treat those children as your own. And that goes for the men who marry women that have children. If not, don't, don't marry that person. You, you can't do that. I don't want to do that. They're not mine. Well, don't marry that person. It's just that simple. Right? But you get into that situation, that's your obligation before the eyes of God. She represents adopted mothers, parents that adopt. Let me tell you, there's a lot of kids that need to be adopted. Church, th this is something that in the next few years, we're, we're going to really push and emphasize and support families that want to adopt. But we need families from church to adopt. A few years ago, um, the LGBTQ plus community was fighting for the right to adopt children. They're adopting kids and the churches. What do you think they're teaching those kids? She represents those grandmothers that took in a grandchild. One of my closest friends that uh, grew up with me here at church, Marco Aragon. Uh, his grandparents, La Hermana Elvira y Manuel Aragon. They, they raised him, and I remember as a kid going to their house, and he would call them ama y apa. He would call them mom and dad. Pharaoh's daughter represents those aunts that have had to take in their nephews or their nieces and, and, and care for them. It represents those oldest sisters, the older sister that, that had to sacrifice for whatever reason and sacrifice education and sacrifice career to take care of their siblings. And she represents those teachers that for eight hours a day often have kids for longer periods of time than their own parents have. She represents those, those mothers that are like over the neighborhood that, that all the kids go to that one particular house, you know. That's how my house was, you know. Uh, all the guys would always come to, to my house because we had the biggest driveway so we could play basketball and because there was always sandwiches and chips and iced tea in the house. And so people were always coming to my house. And my mom was always regañándonos. I should say always giving us advice. <laughs> That's Pharaoh's daughter. And I want to tell you that Pharaoh's daughter, no slouch herself. Tremendous mother. Because it was her father who had given the order to abort, to kill all of the male Hebrew boys. Yet she said, I'm going to bring him. I'm going to save him and I'm going to take him into Pharaoh's house. She didn't care about the consequence. She didn't care about the consequences. She didn't care about the risk. She took in this Hebrew baby boy. Now think of the blessing that she gave Moses. Right. For 400 years, the Hebrew people were raised like slaves. Moses' parents were slaves. Right. His siblings were slaves. Right. His grandparents were slaves. His great-grandparents were slaves. His great-great-grandparents were slaves. His great-great-great-grandparents were slaves. I mean, they were slaves for 400 years. They had slave mentality. They had captured mentality. They, they had that type of mentality. They couldn't think outside of that. Yet this woman takes in this child and doesn't raise up a slave. Instead, raises up a prince in the palace. A prince in the palace. What are you raising, mom, in your house? Pueblo's church, what is being raised in your house? Moses is mentee, the, his um, successor was a young man named Joshua. And Joshua said these famous words. I don't know about you guys, but as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Right? I'm asking you, what are you raising up in your house? Are you raising up slaves or are you raising up princesses? I don't know about you, but in my house, my wife, is raising up princesses. Right? She's raising up princesses. Humble, but princesses. Right? They're going to learn to clean, but they'll be princesses. They're going to learn to cook, but they're going to be princesses. Right? 
That's what, that's what we're raising in our household. And, and it all starts with like how my mom said that she would speak over us and tell us, you have the mind of Christ. You belong to Christ. What is it that you are speaking in the life of your children? Any of us in the Hispanic community, there's probably not a person here who didn't hear from their mom or from their dad, mm, tu no sirves para nada. In other words, mm, no good for nothing. You're good for nothing. Mm, no sabes como hacer nada. Mm, you don't know how to do nothing. You know what? If your kids don't know how to do anything, that's your fault. It's not their fault. They're not going to be born knowing how to do if they don't know how to do something, it's because you haven't taught them. You haven't instructed them. So you're pointing the finger at yourself. Mm. Oh, man, the one that chats my hide. Moms, I'm about to exhort you. I love you, but I'm about to exhort you. Mm. Igual a tu papá. Mm. Just like your dad. Really? Really? You're not only insulting your child, but you're insulting the father of your child with, mm. Dad's Father's Day is around the corner. And from here to Father's Day, your wife tells your kids, mm, igual a tu papa to put them down. You let me know so I can adjust my message. <laughs> I got your backs, Dad. All right. I got your backs, all right? I know it's Mother's Day, but I got your back, all right? You don't talk to your kids like that. You, you don't talk to your kids like that. If you tell your kids, mmm, igual a tu papá, just like your dad, you better follow up with, mmm, igual a tu papá, trabajador, hard worker. You better follow up with, igual a tu papá, with, mmm, igual a tu papá, simpático, handsome. You better follow up with, mm, igual a tu papá with, mm, igual a tu papá de inteligente, and not say it sarcastically, right? Like, ooh, smart like your dad, and not be all sarcastic. Because we are raising up prince and princesses. We're not raising up slaves. We are raising up future pastors. We are raising up future evangelists, future missionaries, future teachers, future apostles. That's what we're raising up here. I don't know what's going on in some other church. But I know that you know what you need to be saying to your kids. You better be reminding them that they have the mind of Christ, that they're created in the image of our heavenly Father. I tell you, I pray over my girls. I, first, first, I start by kissing their feet. I don't care if they're playing outside. I start kissing their feet. Because the Bible says that precious are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. And, I, and I, I, I claim that over them. I'm like, you're going to preach the gospel of peace. I don't care. Dusty, dirty, sock fuzz. I don't care. I'm going to kiss these feet because you're going to preach the gospel of peace. I tell, I tell my daughters, I learned from my brother, you're blessed and highly favored. I tell my daughters that all the time. You're blessed and highly favored. I tell my daughters what scripture says. You're the head and not the tail. I tell my daughters all the time, you're going to be a lender and not a borrower. You're not going to be asking people for, for 50 bucks, 100 bucks. No, you, you'll have 100 bucks to, to, to give to people, to help people. I, I, I pray over my daughters. I say, God, bless them. I don't say bless them so they can drive a BMW, so they can live in a big house, so they can go to Bora Bora on vacation. I say, God, bless them so that they can be a blessing for others. I don't know about you. But as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. I hope that you're serving the Lord, and I hope that you're speaking life into your kids' lives. I mean, Pharaoh's daughter is raising up a prince. You think she's telling him, mm, you Hebrew? You think she was telling him that? You just like them. You think she was telling them that? No. Not at all. She raised up a prince. The Bible says of Moses that never before and never after was there a prophet like him who spoke to God face to face. Moses gave us the first five books of the Bible. He's an educated man. He gave us the law right, through God, but he, God, he was the instrument God used. He gave us the law that today we still study the law, the Ten Commandments. 
There was a prophecy for the Hebrew people that one day there would be a prophet like Moses and the command was to obey him. He was what we would call a, a type of Christ, a prototype of Christ, like a, refle a, a representative of Christ. He wasn't Christ, but he was like Christ. And the, Jesus is Christ. And Christ means anointed one. And in, in the Old Testament, there were three people that were anointed, prophets, priests, and kings. Right? Moses was a prophet. He came from the priestly family, and he was a type of king all pointing to another that would come after him. All pointing to Jesus. You think that Pharaoh's daughter brought him in, paid a Hebrew woman to raise him, brought him into the house to call him a loser, good for nothing, you don't know what you're doing, you're just like your father. No, ma'am. No. Happy Mother's Day. La que las regañe. Happy Mother's Day to all the jokebeds that are amongst us who have given birth. And Happy Mother's Day to all of the Pharaoh's daughters that are amongst all the princesses that are amongst us. That you may not have given birth, but you've given life. I respect you both. I'm going to finish my message. And I want to share with you just four truths that we learn of these two tremendous mothers, right? Something you can take with you. Everybody can take, us, take this with us. First truth is be brave, right? Mom, be brave. We, we need brave mothers, right? Your children need you to be brave, right? Hokabeth was a brave woman. She understood the consequence. She understood the order. She understood the law. She understood the consequence, not just to, to baby Moses, but to her family, to herself. Yet for three months, she hid him. She took care of him. She protected him. She nursed him. And then she was willing to deal with the house of the enemy of her people and receive payment to raise him. This princess, Pharaoh's daughter, she's a brave woman, knowing what her dad had commanded, knowing the, 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 the storm that she could have brought on herself, on her house, on her servants. She took in this baby and we read, adopted him as if he were her own. She's brave. Mom, dad, we need you to be brave. Okay. Second thing we're going to take with us is choose life. Choose life. It would have been convenient for her to abort this baby. It would have been convenient for Pharaoh's daughter to not deal with that responsibility in abort. It would, it would have been safer for everybody. It would have been ideal for everybody. He wasn't born in the best of circumstances. I, I remember that after we had Rebecca, Naily became pregnant with Raquel, and, and I told my mom, I'm like, hey, Naeli's pregnant. And, um, and, and I was like, and we might go for another one even after this. And my mom was like, no, no, don't have kids anymore. I'm like, come on, don't have kids anymore. And I say this with all respect, my mom is here. She's like, don't have kids anymore. Mijo, the world is so ugly. She's like, the world's so ugly. Don't have kids and don't have any more kids. And I told my mom, mom, I'm going to have more kids because my kids are going to change this world. Yeah. See, because that's what I'm raising in my house. What are you raising in your house? Choose life. Speak life into your children. Don't, don't, don't speak death. Don't take the easy way out. Young girls, you're here. If you ended up getting pregnant and you don't know what to do, come talk to your pastor. I'm here for you. We're, we're a church. We're here to support you. The best decision you'll make is to keep that baby. And if you can't raise that baby, talk to me. We'll help you figure out how to get that baby adopted or something. But the worst decision you can make is to abort that baby. You will live with that in your heart the rest of your life. And no amount of forgiveness. God has forgiveness and mercy, but you will have that scar with you forever. You can't undo that. You can't take that back. Right? Choose life. When my mom was pregnant of my sister, my mom had had two cesarean C-sections already. My brother, myself, she had had issues with her breast. The doctor, and then immediately after I was born, my sister and I were only 14 months apart. The doctor told my mom, you need to abort that baby. You have that baby, that baby is going to be born deformed, you're at risk. You know. She chose life. She told the doctor, I'm going to keep the baby, it's going to be a girl, and she's going to be perfect. 
She's going to be perfect. The doctor told her, how do you know that? You don't know that. She said, oh, I do know that, and you're going to see. Right? Years later, that doctor became a Christian and told my mom, I never forget your faith. I never forget your faith that you chose life when it would have been easier to choose death. Be brave. Choose life. The third, I want to leave you with the word that the, 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 is the third one. It's next. It's next. You don't know who that kid is. Right? I, I bet in, in, in Hokabet's wildest dreams, she never imagined that she had the next prophet of God in her midst. She knew he was special. She knew he was beautiful, but I bet she never imagined that she had the liberator of their people there under her care. You don't know who's under your eyes, who's under your protection, who's under your care. It, he, she may be the very next doctor that we need, the next attorney we need, maybe the next pastor we need, the next evangelist we need, the next prophet we need, the next apostle we need, the next missionary we need. It may be the next president, maybe the next engineer, the next, the next inventor that's going to invent something that's going to make all our lives easier. I mean, you don't know what is next in the life of that child. Keep praying for them. It's never too late. It is never too late for you to be praying for your children. Right? It's never too late. Because I tell you what we need. What we need, what the church needs, what society needs, what our country needs, is moms who will spend time on their knees advocating, interceding, praying for their children. We need you, mom. We need you praying for us. Mi hermana Ortega is present here, and a few years ago, her youngest son, Jeremy, passed away. And um, when they had the funeral for Jeremy, we had it here at, at the church, and man, it, it, was, it was packed. He, he filled the church. And my dad was ministering at that funeral, and, and I'll never forget that uh, my dad said of Jeremy, he said, he's a son of promise because his mom has promise. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you and all your house shall be saved. He told everybody there, he goes, I hope, I wish that you have a praying mama at home. There's power when you have a praying mama. Right? Power when you have a praying mama. You know, it, there, as I was growing up, and, and there was a constant calling on my life. But, you know, you get teen years and you get into your 20s and sometimes we're, we're in places that we shouldn't be. I remember this one particular time I was somewhere where I shouldn't have been. And this lady from church saw me there and she told, I don't know what she was doing there. I know I shouldn't have been there. But anyways, and so she went and told my mom, I saw your son at such and such place. And my mom responded and told her, I don't know about those things. All what I know is that my son belongs to Jesus. Let me tell you, mom, you don't know what's the next that you have under your care, but we need you praying for him because your son, your daughter, your nephew, your niece, your grandchild, that kid that lives across the street, those kids in your classroom, they will belong to Jesus. God will rise them up to set his people free, but we need you praying and interceding for them. Next. Next. You don't know what's the next. What's the next that you don't know the potential that is there before your eyes? When I first started pastoring, I, I, it was around Father's Day, and I ministered on Father's Day. And, and I remember I was, I was uh, walking uh, uh, to my office, and, and this uh, hermano from the church came up to me, and, and, he, and he was like very like heartbroken. And he looks at me and he says, Pastor, you think I'm, I'm a failure as a dad? I looked at him like, what? And he goes, you, you think I'm a failure as a dad? I don't know what I said in the message that gave him that impression. But I looked at him, I'm like, no, man, just keep praying for your kids. And I, and I walked away. Right? You know, maybe you, you hear a message like today and, and, and you say like, man, like, like, like I, I felt in so many ways. I, nothing like Coca Beth, nothing like Pharaoh's daughter. I felt in so many. It's, it's not too late. It's not too late. I say this with all respect. My mom's been here in all the services, so it's not the first time I'm saying this. But for every time that my mom put my hand over me and said, Mijo, you have the mind of Christ. You belong to Jesus. There were other times where she told me worse things. Right? Where she told me bad things. 
to this day. As a matter of fact, I think it was even yesterday. My mom was all like, mijo, perdóname por ser una madre mala, right? You know, mijo, forgive me for being a, 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 a bad mother. And I tell her, mom, it's okay. I'm just thankful that the neighbor didn't raise me because she would have been way worse, you know, like it's all right. There's no perfect mother amongst us. We need you praying for your kids. I messed up and mine are older now. They need you praying for them. I have some of my uncles, man, they're, they're, they're bad. They were horrible. And my great-grandparents, their grandparents, my great-grandfather, he was in his 80s. And in his 80s, every weekend, he would fast and pray for his entire family. And I remember one time we were looking at my uncles, and my dad said, those guys right there, they're alive simply because of the prayers of your great-grandfather. And my mom is witness here that when my great-grandparents passed away, that protection in a certain way was removed over their lives. Right? I'm thankful that they all had the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ planted in their hearts before they, they died. But, but, you know, it was the power of that prayer over them. Mom, you don't know who's the next, the next Billy Graham in front of you. Ponte orar. The next Apostle Paul in front of you. Ponte orar. Just pray for him. The next Luke who's going to write something that's going to impact our lives. Pray for them. And if you will give life, soul life in your kids, I finish with this. God will be kind to you. God will be good to you. He'll be kind to you. When we were reading there about those midwives back in um, Exodus chapter 1, it says in verse 20 that God was good to the midwives. Remember, they chose life. They were brave. They, they disobeyed the king. They chose life. And it says God was good to the midwives. Be brave. Choose life. Intercede, advocate, pray for your children, for those kids that are around you, your nephews, your nieces, your, your grandchildren, the kid across the street, the kid that walked into your office, whatever. And God will be kind to you. Once again, happy Mother's Day. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you for Pueblo's Church today. I thank you that we were able to come to praise, to worship, and to honor the mothers, and then to receive this message. Lord, I put every one of our mothers, cada madrecita linda, bonita, hermosa, beautiful, good mothers that today said present, made their way to church. Help them to be brave. Help them to choose life, to sow life in their kids. Help them to understand the potential of the next that is before their eyes. And I ask that you would be kind to them. Let your grace and favor be over them. That your name would be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen.